there are some folks who throughout the series, maybe some of you guys are, you're wanting to keep track with the revelation and maybe you're sort of struggling or maybe you have struggled at some point to see how a God of love could also be so graphic about the impending wrath that is coming. And this is a really important conversation to have. I know we're having a little bit of fun tonight, but this is a really important conversation to have. So let me just say this. If you're completely new to the sermon series and you're like, man, I just came to church, you know, wanting to be able to hear a good sermon, or I'm just checking out the church, let me just say this for those of you who are maybe newer tonight or those of you who you've kind of been in and out of the sermon series and you're like, I'm not really sure uh, what the whole book is all about. I liken it a little bit to uh, in uh, C.S. Lewis' Chronicle of the Narnia series, the, the, the um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Those of you who've ever read that, you know that inside of that particular story, Lucy, one of the heroines of the story, she is at the magician's house. And in the magician's house, she's looking through the books there, and she pulls a book out that's just a very fantastical type of a book and she opens up the book and she begins to read the book and she's enthralled in the story and when she all of a sudden she kind of comes to a place where she's like wait wait wait, what what did I read so she goes back and she tries to reread what she just read and what happens she realizes it's sort of impossible for her to quite grasp what she has just read and maybe some of you guys have been a you've read the book of revelation of the revelation and you're like I just, I'm not really sure. I mean, in the end, she kind of just says, I I know that it was about a cup and a tree and a garden and a hill. And maybe you're a little bit like that and you've gotten little bits and pieces. Let me just say this. You're in the same boat with the majority of people who have read through that book. Now, what we have said from the beginning is that there are plain things in here and that the main thing is the plain thing, and the plain thing is the main thing, and we're going to stick to that tonight. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into Revelation, the 15th chapter of Revelation. The point that we've really been trying to hammer is that Revelation was not written to satisfy our curiosity, okay, but to shape our character. And, And really what we mean by that is who we are on the inside, our thoughts, our motives, our loves, who we are on the inside actually changes because of what we see and what we read and what we learn from this book. So for those of you who have not been on this journey with us, or maybe you just need a good old reminder, the book of Revelation was written by a man who was exiled to the tiny island off the coast of Turkey in the Aegean Sea named John. Now, this book was really written for the purpose of helping struggling churches to be, who were going through persecution or maybe doubts with their faith to help them to recognize that this was supposed to be an encouragement and a blessing for them to persevere in their faith. And it's not just for those earliest generations, but this book is helpful. It's a blessing. In fact, at the very beginning of Revelation 1, if you read Revelation 1, it says that if you just simply read this book out loud, it says that there is a blessing just by reading it for us. So let that be an encouragement to you because we have read pretty much now up to to chapter 14. We've read the whole thing. Uh, We're going to read 15 and 16 today as well. And while we read this, keep in mind this thing. With apocalyptic and I'm not necessarily referring, you know, don't think zombies. Think, think of the uncovering or a pulling back. Think about a pulling back of like a curtain. And that is what John is doing with what is already a thing. What is already with God is being kind of pulled back and shown to us through imagery. And uh, the reason for this is that the, uh, the author not only wants us to hear the word of God and to see the word of God, but actually to feel the word of God. So he uses a lot of imagery to help us evoke some emotion in us so that we can kind of get a better picture of what's going on here. So with that being said, let's go ahead and open up Revelation 15. It'll be on the screens as well. Beginning in verse number one. 
Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image, the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So church, what we're going after today is that in the end, God's holiness is what takes center stage. Sometimes when I read through the Revelation, I like to pretend like John is one of the characters in um, Ebenezer Scrooge's Christmas Carol, which, by the way, best, best Christmas movie, first of all. It's a little debate with my family and I. Any version of the movie, it's the best. But I I, I like to imagine that as John John is kind of being carried around from scene to scene like Ebenezer was with the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present and the ghost of Christmas future, that he's kind of being carried around. And in, in one way, he kind of looks to his right and all of a sudden, what does he see? He sees an army and he looks to his left and he sees a choir and they're all singing. And then he, he, he looks straight ahead and he sees all these you know, the throne of God, and he looks this way, and it's just all happening so quickly. But in this particular scene, John is back in heaven. He looks out next to the throne of God, and what does he see? He sees a group of people that are all holding harps. Now, I've been told this, and you can fact check this if you want, but from what I've been told, a harp is, 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 you know, biblically speaking, you shouldn't necessarily think of a big old stand-up thing that everybody's kind of holding these giant things and playing them, but it's actually closer to what we would use as a guitar. So now change the visual. You've got a crowd of people, and if this is correct, they're all holding a guitar in their hands. So I think that this is pretty cool. And, and not only this, but they're all singing this song of celebration. And John is all of a sudden, he's like, oh, I know this song. This is the song of Moses. This is, the, this is the, the, the kind of the, the famous song of Moses. Of course, in, in, in their Jewish you know, history and custom, they would know these songs by heart. They would sing them in their worship gatherings together. And he's like, man, I know this song. But they're also kind of singing this newer song. It's the song of the Lamb. And I imagine that as John sees what he sees, maybe he asks whoever is giving him this vision or whoever is presenting this guide, who are these people? He tells us. He tells us that these are the ones who have conquered the beast and its image. So he gives us this this picture of now this sort of army holding guitars and they're singing this song out together. But immediately, this, this language is a hyperlink to what we've already seen. You see, we got to go back a little bit in the Revelation to see now there's something in particular about what he said. They have conquered the beast. And I think that initially for me, that image is a very battle, you know, hard fought battle, bloody scene of that they've gone through this conquest and there's now this, very, this victory. I mean, these are the first fruits of the reaping from chapter number 14. They're the ones who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. They're the ones who have gone through great tribulation. Now, they've not conquered the beast in the typical hard-fought, bloody battle sense. You see, they've conquered the beast by persevering through great tribulation without succumbing to the persecution, without pledging allegiance to the beast. Guys, I want to pause here for just a second because this is such a big deal. I don't know about you. I, I, I love sports. I love playing sports. I love watching sports. I love winning. Also, I absolutely hate to lose. But here's the thing. In God's economy, winning a lot of times looks like you're losing. 
See, in God's economy, strength often looks more like weakness than what we would imagine strength looking like. In God's economy, this is what happens. And what I'm not saying is that this group did nothing to join the heavenly gathering. What I'm saying is that this group endured what must have looked and felt a lot like failure and suffering while maintaining hope to be able to see and stand around the throne of God. Let me ask you this, church. Hey, are, are you on the brink of walking away from the church? Man, I love Jesus. I love the word. I'm just frustrated with the people. I hate to say, I hate to say this because it's going to sound so simplistic. These are the ones who are standing around the throne. Hear me on this because this is, this is really important. When we're thinking about walking away, whether it's from the church or, or walking away from a marriage, walking away from a family, walking away from whatever, community, whatever, when we think about that, let's not allow things like social media to push us over that edge. And you know what I'm talking about. If you are on social media platforms and you scroll through and what do you see? Highlight after highlight after highlight, beauty, perfection. Why is that? Well, simply it's because we don't post the suffering stuff. Of course, we all avoid the people who are like, you know, that person just complains. All the, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. But he, here's the reality, guys. Walking away will, will, will sort of prevent us from being able to join this crowd. Philippians 3.10, I think what Paul said here is so important for us. Talking to the church in Philippi, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. I think that, I think that we as maybe in, in, our, in our generation or something about our culture around us, we do whatever we can to, to minimize pain and suffering and maximize pleasure. And we've got to be able to see and learn from this. This is shaping our character now. This, this group of people, they went through it. And, and suffering is, is hard. But I wonder if maybe part of that is, it makes that song so much sweeter. John is now also drawing from another Old Testament story. I wonder if you caught it as we read through those verses. They're standing next to a, a sea that is mingled with fire, okay? Red sea here that they're standing next to. They're singing the song of Moses. This sort of gets us to go all the way back to the book of Exodus and to be able to see this first Exodus where God rescued his people from the hands of the enemy. And the judgment of God is what fell on the Egyptian army. What happened? They, the Bible says that they were consumed by that water and they were never again seen. Now that now, now the, the children of Israel are headed toward the promised land. They're headed toward Canaan. And I, I think of that when I think of this group of people who have actually come out of great tribute. They, they, they've made it through. Now they're standing around the throne. Guys, again, let me just kind of pause and say this. Man, are, are we looking forward to being able to, to be a part of that number, to be able to stand next to those who have gone through great tribulation. Um, kind of going back to a little bit of the sports analogy, um, I don't know if you've, you've ever seen kind of the, the New Zealand rugby team has kind of been sensational for uh, their haka, this ritual dance that they do. I won't illustrate for you tonight, but this dance is 100% designed for intimidation. 
I mean, it's crazy. If you go watch it, it's crazy. Their tongues are sticking out, and they're like, you know, pounding on their, their it's very intimidating. Even, even watching it on YouTube, I was a little bit intimidated myself. Um, and, and, and this is what's interesting to me. This is before they go into battle. Before they go into battle, they're up there, and their goal is just to intimidate the fire out of these people, that the, the, these teams that they're facing. These teams literally are standing on the other side and just watching these guys do this. And Andrew mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. When we sing, we're engaging in spiritual warfare. We're engaging in the battle. Look, and, and I know this because I've, I've, done the, I've been guilty of this myself, where it's like, if I've had a good week, I'll walk in and I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to worship, ready to, you know, kind of get it on and my hands are raised and I'm singing at the top of my lungs. But guys, this is not, spiritual warfare is not about how you felt that you did during the week. Spiritual warfare is about reminding yourself that it's not about your works. It's not about your righteousness, that we actually are going to stand next to the ones who have been through the great tribulation. We are going to stand around the throne of God and sing to our king. That is what this worship and spiritual warfare is all about. So this ushers us right back into John's vision where he makes it really crystal clear. This is not just another enemy that has been defeated by the righteous acts of God. Okay, this isn't just another judgment or display of God's judgment. This celebration is taking place. I don't know if you saw these words, but it's because the wrath of of God is finished. The wrath of God is finished. So with these set of judgments, the wrath of God is now finished. So, so I want you to think about this before we move on. The first song that they sang, the song of Moses, kind of gets you back, thinking back to the great, the first exodus. But then there's the song of the lamb. And what is that supposed to evoke in us? Well, as Christians, this is the song that we get to sing. This is the song that we get to be able to celebrate about. This is about where we pass from death to life. Through that watery grave, we pass through. Sometimes when, when we're singing, I like to envision being a part of this massive throng of people. Of course, holding guitar in hand. And a sea of people standing around the throne of the living God from every tribe and every tongue and every nation worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And guys, here's the thing. We're not like the, the, the New Zealand rugby team where we're trying to intimidate. We've actually already won. We're just waiting for the hope. We're waiting for the event to actually occur. How, how much more should we actually be celebrating? The song of the Lamb points us back to the place where the cup of the wrath of God was not poured out, but rather the author of the Gospels tells us that Jesus prayed this prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Guys, Jesus drank, willingly drank the cup of the wrath of God, absorbing the Father's wrath that we deserved. That's why we celebrate. The Song of Moses and the Lamb help us to see sort of what was, what was going on. John kind of enters into this. He sees, okay, they're, they're, they're rejoicing over the song, of, you know, they're rejoicing over the rescue. They're rejoicing because they've made it out of great tribulation. And if you're just reading these lyrics, I mean, this is a pretty awesome song about the character of God. It talks about his great deeds. It talks about his amazing deeds, his justness, his truth. And I mean, the song says it's so, he's so awesome that, I mean, who's not going to fear this God? Who's not going to glorify this God? It even says that all the nations are going to worship him because of his righteous acts have been revealed. So what's not to be celebrated here? I think that that's what we get at in this next section. Verses 5 through 8 say, After this I looked in the sanctuary 
of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So as we read just a moment ago, Seven, seven angels carrying seven bulls. And you, you want to be thinking uh, of, of sort of ritual bulls, not like what you're going to eat, Captain Crunch in the morning, that, that type of bull. It's not like that kind of a bull. These bulls are filled to the brim, it says, with the wrath of God. So the question that I have is, okay, so who are, who is, who, 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 who is, sorry about that, a little. Who is this wrath for? Here's these seven angels. They're, they're, they're kind of being commissioned to be able to go out from the tent, from the sanctuary. They're carrying these bowls that are filled to the brim. Who in the world is this for? We continue to read chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second angel poured out its bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So who is God's wrath that is inside these bowls carried by these seven angels intended for and guys, I think that this is where a lot of people, I'm talking Christians and non-Christians, become really uncomfortable. And I think it's safe to say that most people are okay if we say, hey, God's wrath is for Satan and his demons and probably some unsavory folks down the line in history and Bill on the next door app. I think that we're okay, maybe not that last part, maybe we're okay with being able to say, yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's for Satan and his demons. But what if we said, no, no, God's wrath is for those who have pledged their allegiance to the beast? And, and maybe we might be thinking, well, yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, the, the, the real, you know, satanic people, they're pretty bad. You know, I'm okay with Satan and all the people who are really, really bad, kind of who follow him. Here's the reality. Those who pledge allegiance to the beast aren't necessarily running around performing seances with a pentagram, you know, tattooed on their face. That's, that's not the image we should be getting. In fact, if we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus directly confronting and even naming someone the children of Satan. Do you remember who that was? It was the religious leaders, John 8. Children of the devil. He's very direct with them. He gets very direct in Matthew 23 as well when he's talking to the same group of religious leaders, telling them, you're the ones who murdered, you're the ones who murdered the prophets of the Old Testament. Guys, I, I, I think when we try to make comparisons with the people who are around us instead of seeing ourselves up against the holiness of God, that's what happens. We're, we're, we're right here. We're going, well, you know, I mean, the, there, there's the terrorists and there, there's, you know, there's the people who do mass shootings and then there's, 
we kind of go down this list and we start to create categories of those who deserve the wrath of God versus those like us who kind of don't really deserve that. Here it is. Unless we grasp God's holiness, we will no longer be amazed by his grace. I think that, that even as a church culture, sometimes we assume holiness and we just, we, 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 we're, we're so um, into the whole, you know, grace, grace, grace. And it is. I'm not saying that we're not, a, we're 100% grace. But until we understand it, let me tell you, you will be more amazed by the grace of God when you understand the holiness of God. As human beings, we, we tend to look at evil like it's out there. And, and maybe we even think things like, well, you know, I wouldn't want to be that person standing before God on judgment day. Guys, I wouldn't want to be like this person. If I had to stand before God on judgment day and, 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 and say, you know, who, who's going to be responsible for what you've done? I think instead we take the posture of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, when he saw the holiness and the brilliance of God, terrifying yet compelling, a consuming fire. What did he say? Woe is me. I'm undone. What did he mean? He meant that his character, who he thought he was, was beginning to be tore apart. God had broken it down by the mere sight of the holiness of God. It broke down everything he had built his life thinking who he was. That's how the Apostle Paul could say later in his life, he said, everything that I've, I've accumulated, it's all, go it's all rubbish. In fact, it's literally a pile of, you know what? That's what he says. He says refuse. Man, can we get to a point where we say, what a wretched man I am, like he says in Romans 7. Who's going to rescue me from this body subjected to death? John Stott said, before we can begin to see the cross as something for us, we have to see it as something done by us. And guys, the whole commissioning, the context of the commissioning of the angels to pour out the bowls, is that they're exiting the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven. This is meant to evoke in us the weight of the holiness of God and thereby produce in us reverential awe. You see, if, we, if we're sitting back going, you know, I mean, I, I, I kind of like, I love the whole God story, but I probably would have done some things a little differently. You know, God, are you, are you sure? Hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Are, are you sure that that's the decision that you want to make, God? God created the universe and everything in it. His sovereignty affords him the freedom to do whatever he wants in the world he created. So let me ask you this and ask myself this. If you could do anything you wanted, and let me just add a caveat, and never be responsible for that. Never be caught for that. What would you do? I think that there's a reason why there's five different uh, movies called The Purge. And now they've got like a Christmas purge and a cowboy purge. I mean, if they've gone crazy. Why is that? The fantasy of so many is, man, if I could do whatever I want, this is what I would do. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His actions, the song says, his actions are just and true. They're not in the same category. God is not in the same category as us. Yes, we have thoughts. 
But his thoughts are in a completely different category. Outside of time and space, God's ways are outside of all of our... They're not to be compared with our ways. We trust the justice of God because of his truth. There is no lie or untruth in him. So what does God do with evil? What does God do with those who openly reject his offer of forgiveness? Let me ask you this. Have you ever had uh, one of your children maybe come to you? If you have children, maybe they've, they've come to you before and maybe they've had their, their, their feelings hurt by somebody else. What does that evoke in you? Now, let me take that one step closer. I know we don't really like to go here and I'm not going to go here very long. What if you witness one of your children actually being harmed? Somebody very close to you being harmed. What would that evoke in you. And let me ask you this, what kind of a parent would I be if I stood by and idly watched or worse, allowed it to continue? You see, it would be unloving for God to allow evil to continue in the world. So church, we're going to cover this last portion, Revelation 16, 10 through 21, very quickly. Let me read. And we're not going to be able to hunt down every single one of these bowls today. But I want to just go ahead and read it. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. Verse 7, excuse me, the last verse says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. John's point here, while we're not going to have time to go through each one of these bowls, Very similar to the seven trumpets. So if you want to go back and and reread that, you'll see a lot of similarities there. But what John clues us in on is that it's not necessarily what happened or where it happened or even how it happens, but who did it happen to and what was their response. And sadly, as we're reading, you read, even when people are infected with such intense sores and boils and even when their food is gone and their fresh water is gone and even when the sun is literally scorching them their response is not okay okay enough i repent what is their response their response and their reaction is to curse god and they did not repent (coughs) see judgment is not arbitrary Judgment is not without purpose. But here's the, here's the good news of all this. We're reading this in a book. And if you're here today, you should consider this to be a warning of what is coming in the future. Maybe you, you don't consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus. You don't consider yourself to be a Christian The good news is that this is not happening right now. This is forward-looking. 
The good news is that if we have lost loved ones, which by the way, I have a father and a family who's been praying for uncles and aunts and cousins for 35 years since my dad became a Christian. There is, I guarantee he has not missed a day where he has not prayed for his brothers and his, his, his sister-in-laws and his nephews and nieces to come to faith in Christ. This should cause us to not say, hey, hey we're, we're good. We're good. But instead, this should compel us to say, man, we don't really have time to waste. There is a people out there who judgment is going to come if they do not receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that this is, it's not our job to save them, but we do know that God has given us the call to go and to reach them. So in closing, a few applications here. If you're not a Christian, I think the application is very clear. It's admitting that you are a sinner. It's admitting that your sin is deserving of God's judgment. And then it's believing that Christ has done everything necessary for your salvation. And calling upon the name of the Lord. Man, if that's you here tonight, I do want to encourage you. We're going to have a prayer team here at the end who would love to talk with you, love to pray with you. And if you're a Christian, I know that even sermons like this can hit pretty hard. Because I know that many people in our church are coming out of, a, of a, maybe a pretty dark season. I was talking with someone just a couple of days ago and he said, my season of life is like a country song. And he wasn't joking. He said, lost my job, my dog died, and my wife's truck broke down. Broke down. He chuckled. Tough. The pastors here, and I'm sure even others, it's every single week we're, we're getting communicated to emails, prayer down here in the front, people walking through very difficult dark seasons. Why am I saying this? I think sometimes when we're walking through a dark season, we could start to wonder, man, am I underneath the wrath of God? Like, is this judgment that is being brought down on me? And church, I think if you're a Christian here today, we need to be able to remember this. Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And that is good news. You say, well, what, what, how do you explain what I'm going through? Well, the author of Hebrews can help us. He says, but, you know, our fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But our Father, our Heavenly Father, He disciplines us for our good. And check this out. It's to share in His holiness. <clears throat> hey, don't be someone here tonight who when you're experiencing that discipline that you sort of suppress and you push down and you ignore or you walk away or you get hard against God. Instead, recognize this. Those, 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 that discipline is an invitation. And he's calling you into deeper intimacy with himself. Sharing in his sufferings. You might need prayer tonight. You, we all need prayer. But we might need to act on that tonight and say, man, I just... I just want to pray with somebody about whether it's your salvation or it's about this application that we're not underneath the wrath of God. So this should mean at least two things. One, we should be the most grateful people on earth. And two, we should be the most passionate people on earth, especially when it comes to bringing signs of the kingdom. Man, I want to be able to see Mercy Hill Church 
get to see that like the gospel of Jesus come to full bloom right here in the triad that spills over to the nations. Man, don't you want to see that? That happens as a grateful people. We allow that overflow to spill over into joy, into love, and into mission. Guys, let's pray. God, you're so gracious to us. We love you. We thank you so much for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. We ask you, Lord Jesus, now, you'd help us to lean in to deeper intimacy with you. Lord, if there's anybody here without you, may they not leave here without first talking to somebody at least getting their questions answered, at least praying with somebody. God, we give you praise and thanks for your goodness to us. In Christ's name, amen.